but um, there is a lot of benefits to teaching on Zoom. Um, prob I mean, the first one is I've got students from Texas and I've got students mm -hmm. from New York and uh, East Coast and Washington that, you know, wouldn't probably want to drive so far, even the uh, far side of Portland. Um, I think, Kate, you were saying that you're, you know, from the far sides of far reaches of Portland. Um, and uh, so mm -hmm. this is a great way that we can all get together. And I love painting in my studio. I'm not going to lie. It's, you know, if you've ever been in my classes in person, I carry one of those giant Tupperware bins just full mm -hmm. of stuff. And inevitably, I still forget you know, things or, you know, questions come up that I'm like, oh, I wish I had this or that. And uh, in my studio, I have most of it available to me and it's been fun. I can just, oh, that reminds me of a painting and run into the other studio and grab that. Or that reminds me of this book and uh, grab it off my, um, off my shelf. Um, I also have every color that I've ever bought. There's <laughs> <laughs> so very many. Um, and so we get to play with that. Um, for those of you who have had me in the past, know a little bit about how I like to teach. And it's not too different than a lot of um, other teachers, except for, I will say, I do do a lot more painting um, than most teachers, I think. In fact, in college, most of my instructors, I don't know if I ever saw them paint. <laughs> And being an exceptionally visual learner, I always found it very weird. I even remember, you know, taking psychology classes and painting classes at the same time and realizing that we don't even, like, if I just say a color red, we're all picturing slightly different variations on that, you know, and then it gets even much more difficult when I say, you know, a pale blue, green, gray. Uh, you know, uh, what does that mean? Um, and so by actually being able to show you, I think it just that much better. And the great thing again about this video uh, format is you can paint along. I love when people paint along or, you know, are working on things, but it's just as fine to literally sit, watch, ask questions, take notes and be a part of the class. And then you can go back watch it and if you're trying to keep up i know i paint pretty quickly i've been painting for you know at least a couple of weeks now and i'm getting faster and um just years and years and years um you can pause it you can rewind it you can fast forward through the boring parts like what's going on right now <laughs> and uh get to the good stuff um so i like to present my classes by basically describing what it is we're going to go over very quickly uh, some lesson. If we have time, I like to do a little <laughs> bit of feedback or critique, um, and that's what we're going to be using the Facebook group for. So please, if you have not um, signed up for, where did I go? No, not that one. Um, if you have not signed up for our Facebook page, Everybody can see the Facebook page now over here, Creative Color in the Luminous Landscape. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we have 22 people signed up. So I think that means there's uh, two or three that are still not on there. So please sign up because that is a great place for us to share things. Here's the Zoom link for all the classes. And I just posted a bunch of pictures of uh, different skies because that's going to be part of our exercise today. Um, and where I can share notes, and more importantly, where you guys can share your work in progress as you're going along. Um, and I can give feedback, other students can give feedback, and we can all learn from each other's masterpieces, and just as importantly, from our less than masterpieces, maybe even some um, paintings gone askew, paintings gone wrong. Um, people don't really like to hear it, but if you are taking time, paying attention and being present with your painting, we can learn just as much, if not more, from our bad paintings. It all comes down to asking questions. 
And the cool thing is, is when we see other people's work, it might be fantastic and we can, you know, borrow some of the ideas, but we can also look at the other people's paintings and say, you know, that's really neat, but you know what, I probably wouldn't have done it that way, or I wouldn't do that. Um, and I want you guys to start doing that to all paintings as you're looking at them, all artwork that you're going forward is kind of begin to give them gentle critiques and kind of how would I do it differently? Is everybody in here, let me go back, um, on the Facebook page? Raise your hand if you are not. Let's do it that way. Are not. Everybody, oh. Oh, I am, I am. Susan, you're on there, I think, aren't you? Yeah. I couldn't find it. Where's? Uh, uh, did you get the email from me? Did everybody get a nice long email from me yesterday? Oh. It's right at the top of that. Okay, sure. Yeah, otherwise it's just called Creative Color in the Luminous Landscape because I took all my creative uh, naming juices just to come up with that title for the class. So I'm going to use that as long as I can. Um, How do we, oh, sorry. How do we watch the video after we're done with the class? Great question, Kate. Um, what I will do is it takes a couple hours for it to download on the Zoom site. I will then load that onto my computer and I had to unload a bunch of those videos because they are huge. You know, um, again, if you've been with me, you know, my classes are generally longer than three hours because uh, I just keep going. And with that being said, real quickly, you can drop off the class at any time. I know you guys have, you know, a life. All of you have very exciting, fun lives beyond this class and uh, or you know meetings or appointments or dogs that need walking whatever it is feel free to drop off at any point I will just keep recording and you can come back to it so don't feel like uh oh I'm you know being mean to Mike and he's gonna notice um, I will notice and I will be sad but I will understand completely um, <laughs> so please do what you need to do so that's being said Kate um, I will download it to my computer. That takes a little bit of time. Then I will download it to a YouTube video um, on my page, which I think is just Michael Orwick on YouTube. If you want to see some of my older videos, you can. Um, and then I will share the link to that, both in the email like I did yesterday and onto the Facebook page. Um, that usually takes about two to three three hours, I think seems to be about how long it all that takes. And I will try to edit out kind of the beginning because as soon as any of you guys um, sign into the class, it starts recording. So don't do anything really embarrassing if you're the first person on the video, because it's just you sitting <laughs> <being> there. <laughs> um, that's why I kind of asked that maybe we sign in at 920. That gives us 10 minutes to kind of test everything make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I will try to edit out that first 10 minutes. But the great thing again, if I don't have that um, done is you can just fast forward through it. And uh, I'm gonna try to do a better job too about writing the, mo the minutes of the video so that you can just fast forward to the color wheel portion of the day or the painting skies portion of the day or if you you know went to well I wouldn't know when you left the, went to a meeting but um anyways I'll try to post that so you can just quickly scrub through or you know fast forward through to the parts that are pertinent to you um so I try to up oops. <laughs> that's my client um I have never figured out how to silence my <laughs> new phone. I, I've tried everything, but um, so maybe I just put it further away. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, okay. So how I teach um, a, a lesson in the beginning today that is going to be color wheels because that is going to be the basis, the foundation for everything we do in the class. Um, if you're anything like me, <laughs> right now, your heart just sank a little bit. Maybe your eyes rolled back a little bit. Um, and you're just like, oh my gosh, color wheel again. I've done hundreds of these in all the different painting classes. And, uh, you know, back in college, even in high school, probably even in middle school. 
Um, and I, I always felt like that about color wheels until, um, well, I guess until I started teaching it. Um, and it was interesting, and I can, I'll talk about this more when I start doing the color wheels, um, is that even when I started teaching it in the very beginning, you know, one red, one yellow, one blue makes basically all the colors. Those are our three primaries, right? I felt like I was teaching a lie. Um, if you've done color wheels using one red, one yellow, one blue, you know that it doesn't make all the colors. And I will show this. I will show the three colors, the cadmium red light or medium, French ultramarine and lemon yellow that I was taught to use and uh, challenged myself for one full year of painting to use just those three colors in white. And then I will describe how I began to add more colors. You can do an immense amount with those three colors, but you're definitely gonna end up with much more gray. You could say naturalistic, but much more gray paintings. And so then I branched out color by color. And in fact, even through teaching, seeing other students colors they were using and adding uh, one color at a time. And I will describe completely that as we go through. So what I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to do four different color wheels. They'll be pretty quick and please just watch along. There's only one of them that I would really urge you guys to do. And that's the one using the split primary palette. Those are the colors that I suggest on our, uh, um, supply list. And um, the other ones I will show just kind of as explainers. Um, one's going to be using the three colors that I was taught with, the red, yellow, blue, French ultramarine, cad red light, and Indian yellow. Another one is called the Zorn palette, which I put into the email, which is a black, a yellow ochre, and um, cad red medium, I think or light, I'm not positive, I have it laid out over there. And then I'm gonna show you a palette that as close as I've been able to replicate is the CMYK. Because I've always wondered how can our printer do so much with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So I've been playing with those, trying to find colors that closest replicate it and just wait to see. It's really interesting. And I'm curious about trying to incorporate maybe some of these colors into my palette at some times, but I think it's really worth seeing and learning about. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to teach the basic, very fundamentals of painting just a clear sky, because that's where we're going to start from. Because all skies are deviations on that. I will be painting about five very quick sky paintings. The, um, and I only want, well, I want as many as you guys want to paint, but I want one. I want your basic blue sky. And it's not, a, you know, not just mix up one color and splash it onto your thing. I will show you kind of the gradients as it goes from warmer at the horizon, lighter, more yellow, as it goes to kind of a green blue, to a baby blue, up to a reddish blue, okay? And you'll see that, and I'll show some examples in my paintings, that those gradients stay fairly similar, just mixing and the colors differently and uh, using slightly different colors. So if we want to get into sunsets, a lot of those gradients still exist. And so it's a great fundamental. So we're going to have two very important fundamentals. Um, and please stick with me. I know that some of you are like, oh man, I just want to paint big glowy skies and mm -hmm. trees and all the other things that I see Michael doing and having a great time. And we are going to get to that. But I want us to have, as always, the building blocks and the understanding. So when we're going a little bit crazy with color and having so much fun and experimenting and playing, 
we have that knowledge and understanding of why it's happening. And that will make our crazy, vibrant, glowy, beautiful skies that much more realistic because we'll have a foundation in reality. Okay, that makes sense. Everybody willing to uh, go on that journey with me? Um, so that being said, like I said, I'm gonna paint, well, as many skies as we have time for today. Um, and I will take some suggestions and, you know, let's bend it towards purples. Let's bend it towards greens. Let's see what happens. And I will throw a couple clouds on top. So after you finish your first blue sky, you are more than welcome to play and experiment. Basically what I did, just like I did with the big piece of cardboard that I gessoed with the gray color and um, I'm going to use for the color wheels. I did the same thing. Uh, and I separated it using blue painter's tape into five small paintings so that I could cover it really quickly. And I don't care about them. I'm not going to sell these. I'm not going to show them to my mom. I'm not going to, you know, I, I, if they're good enough as a reference, it's going to be invaluable that I have it in the studio with me. It's a note. It's an important note just like the color wheel, and I'll be able to use that to build up from going forward. Everybody cool with that? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. And I'm going to try my best to not let it be too boring um, and uh, make it fun. All right. So we have quite a few of us on here. Wow. Yeah, we got a full class. It's 20 of us. Patty, we've lost your video if you care. And Chanda, um, your video is also not showing, if you care. Um, please go to the Facebook page, introduce yourself. You can do it under my question about introducing yourself or just feel free to start a new thing. Um, if you'd like to share any of your artwork under that, uh, feel free. Um, also, I would love to kind of hear your hopes and aspirations from me as a teacher, because we do have six weeks. Um, I can cover quite a lot in that. Um, and we're going to build towards uh, the beach painting um, with the big dynamic pinkish cloud on the left side. It's on the page, um, on the uh, Facebook page. And um, I think it's right near the top there. Um, yeah, Kathleen commented on it. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with that. So that's going to be kind of our goal. We have a lot to learn as we go forward. And you're more than welcome to paint from any of your own references at any time during the class, OK? You're not stuck just copying my painting or using my references. Please, please, please bring your own photos, Your uh, if you want to copy other artists' paintings, um, whatever it is, you're always welcome to do that. We're just going to try to fit it kind of within the assignment because everything is going to be building up off the previous assignments. Again, building blocks. I just really think it's vitally important that we kind of build up together. Another thing to quickly remember before I start painting is you guys are at all different levels. <laughs> Please do not compare yourselves to each other. Um, again, we can learn, we can, you know, borrow, we can gently critique each other, but don't be dissuaded by, you know, uh, Stacy's masterpiece that she posts the first week. Uh, just, yeah, um, you know, know that Carrie's been painting, you know, off and on for a, quite a long time. Mary's been painting for a long time. And some of you guys are absolute beginners and I, that's fantastic. Um, and I'm excited to have you all in the class. In fact, when I teach at Clark College, which I don't do anymore, but when I was teaching, I used to teach a beginning, intermediate and advanced class. And I really, over the years came to realize that it's the same. It's the fundamentals. Just think sports, you know, the, the pro athletes are out there still just shooting free throws and, you know, taking pitches and swinging their bat. There's just practicing the fundamentals. But what we're doing is we're going to be pushing ourselves at the rate that we're comfortable with. 
I don't want it to be scary and too difficult. We're pushing at a rate that is just beyond our knowledge, just beyond our comfort, just a little bit. And so you'll know where that is for yourself. And that's all I ask for you is that you're just stretching your comfort zone a little bit, trying some new things. And hopefully, you know, at the end of these six weeks, you'll have a lot of new tools that will help you become the painter that you're meant to be, not the painter that I am or the painting that, uh, Susan is or Michelle is, but the painting that you're meant to be. Um, so that being said, in the next class after this, I'm just going to promote it already. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> will be about brushwork and edges. We will be touching on that, of course, in this class. The class that was previous to this one was composition and design. And I kind of like to build my classes just like I do each individual class is building blocks. And so, um, Composition and design was the first one. I think that's the most important part of painting. Now the very fun part, everybody's favorite color. Um, it's the showy, loud part of painting. And then we get to go to brushwork and edges, which is kind of the finale. A lot of people want to jump to that right away. They you know see their Monet paintings and I want to paint like Monet. What does that mean? That means beautiful, big, thick paint. I want to paint like Van Gogh. What does that mean? Broken brush strokes and, you know, choppy, thick paint. Um, that will come. And, you know, you'll find your way of uh, painting that's comfortable to you. And that will be in the next grouping. So just in case I don't cover as much of that information as you'd like in these six weeks, that's kind of why we're building up towards that. Um, I think we're already ready to go to the easel. That would be the fastest ever. Normally, again, I go back and forth to the page, maybe talk about some of your paintings if we have time. Um, and again, I'll give uh, feedback on your paintings on the site throughout the week um, as I can. So feel free to post at any time. All right, I am going to change over to this camera that's somewhere behind me. Um, and Michael. We're gonna looking at my palette. Yes, please. Um, can we talk about um, just everybody generally muting their mics um, and then using the space bar to talk? Perfect. Yeah, that's one of the coolest things I discovered in the last class, you guys, is that all you have to do is push down the space bar um, and you can talk that way. You know, if your dog starts barking or the garbage man comes loudly, um, it doesn't take over the mic. The other thing you can do is go to that picture of me. Uh, there's three dots when you uh, hover your mouse over it and you can pin that. Uh, it looks like I could do spotlight for, for everybody. Um, you can change it from gallery view too to speaker view. Um, you know, I talk a lot, so it'll kind of stay on me. Um, let me see if I can. Um, there we go. Any other questions as I move over? and I'll still be able to hear you. Please let me know if you're having any trouble hearing me. Again, I'm just using this, um, where is it? Ball mic here. And it seems to get my whole studio just fine. Find that a lot better than having a, a wired lapel. Um, anyways, I'm gonna change over. There we go, there's my studio. You see the uh, light turned off to the side there. I'm gonna go ahead and turn those lights on as I'm moving over. That should brighten us up a little bit there. We've got two of those new lights on each side. I just try to keep them off while I'm in the background there. I am still working on um, studio lighting. I'm constantly experimenting and trying new things. Um, I found if I cover my windows, I get a little less glare. Um, and this is my setup. Basically for teaching, I found that having a vertical palette, which is a big cutting board, again, painted gray on the back, 
I just flipped it over. It's got the textured side on the back here. On the smooth side, there's the little feet stickers on here. I get it from Bed Bath and Beyond, I guess, and just knock those off with an X-Acto blade. And I've got a really nice heavy duty surface. In fact, I dropped it on the floor this morning and it didn't hurt it at all. Um, and I basically did that to replicate the palette that I normally paint on. What this is, is a big toolbox that has all my brushes, not even close to all my brushes, one fourth of my brushes. Um, and then in each one of the drawers below that, like that's my whites and grays, my yellows, reds, blues and greens, browns, and blacks and super dark colors. Beneath that, I've just got some gloves and uh, painting towels and painting t-shirts to keep putting on. Um, I can zoom in and zoom out. So let me know if you need any of that. Um, and let's talk about the first color palette that I'm going to be using. So in the very beginning, do I, does anybody need me to go over really quickly kind of the very, um, my very basic setup here? Like I have paint thinner over here, some of my mediums. I use um, a glass scraper to clean my palettes. I find that to be much easier. That's one of the huge benefits of glass. Um, if the paint's ever really, really stuck on, which you can see it's pretty well stained, normally this thing is really clean, I will actually scrub some rubbing alcohol, 90 proof rubbing alcohol, let that sit for a couple minutes. In fact, I'll post a video of that to our page. Um, paper towels, I go through so very many paper towels every day. I order these in bulk off Amazon or from Costco. And uh, basically how I clean my brushes is, is I take my paper towel, I pinch the paint, the brush and pull, and that'll get a lot of the paint off. And I do that before I dip it into the paint thinner. Otherwise it takes so much more time to clean your brush. Um, I'll scrub that in the paint thinner just a little bit, bring it back out and do the pinching thing again. If I'm still getting a huge amount of color and I don't want it, then I will just do the process again until I have my desired cleanliness of brush. Hey, Michael. Yes. This is Darla. Um, do you, what kind of brand is that? Is that Costco's brand for paper towels? Uh, I can share. Because you are you trying to avoid like do you try to avoid lint on like them putting any lint on the paint? Yeah, definitely because I do use my paper towels to paint with from time to time. Uh, lint can become a major hassle. It's always a bummer to have to go and pick out you know paint bristle hairs and lint. Uh, when I had a golden retriever, <laughs> dog hair all the time. No matter if the dog didn't come up to the studio that day. Um, so yeah, lint can be an issue. These definitely seem to put out less lint and it's just a blue shop towel. Um, I don't know the name. It looks like I take I took the uh, wrappers off all of them when I put them away. Um, if you can see behind me, that, that white, uh, whatever you call it, closet over there, that is filled with paper towels, paint thinner, my paints, all my supplies. So I, you know, I try to set up everything so that it's kind of in this contained space um, and easily readily available. Um, so there's that. So my what kind first, of easel. What kind of easel do you have? Oh, the best one in the whole world. It is called. Let's see if we can see up top there. Oh crap! Sorry guys, I just uh, disconnected it. Let's see if I can get it back. I can't move the camera very much because uh, so I can get it back here. Are we back? Yes. Yeah. 
Sorry about that, guys. I have to go through this again. Um, anyways, I have a very short, uh, <laughs> very short line on this. Well, six feet, but because I'm pretty far away from where it's plugged in already on the computer. Um, it is uh, too shiny. It's a Hughes easel, H-U-G-H-E-S. Um, I actually have two of these, um, one in both studios. The room next to me is my old studio and uh, my poor wife um, has completely let my daughter and me take over the whole upstairs for uh, all of our art stuff. Um, and when I say the whole upstairs, I mean every inch of it. Um, we have a framing studio. We have a huge amount of storage area for all of our canvases and painting stuff um, in the attic and uh, two studios. Um, and right now there's paintings piled up everywhere. Uh, maybe I'll give a tour on my iPhone and post that later so you guys can kind of get an idea. I know a number of you have been able to uh, visit my studio in the past. Um, the Hughes easel, why I love it, and here just to show off a little bit, is it's very adjustable. And I can put six foot paintings on this, um, which I do paint um, for uh, commissions and different projects. I do paint really large. And in fact, um, I had talked about getting one of these easels for years. Um, and I got a commission to do a, what was it? Six feet tall by 20 feet wide painting for um, a hotel. And I was, um, we did it in four parts. So quad tick, I guess it would be called. And at the beginning of that process, my wife said, well, buy the, um, you know, this is a good time to get the easel because they are a couple thousand dollars or $1,500 or something like that. So it's a big chunk of change. And um, I said, well, I will buy it after the project because I'll have money. And she said, you know, get it now because it'll make the project much easier. And the thing that hit me is I realized that these things last your whole life. They, you know, you know they'll, they'll be heirlooms. I'll be able to pass them on. And uh, I mean, they're really sturdy. And so basically not having it and planning to have it was actually a waste of money because I would have it forever. And I, I absolutely love it. I love it more than I love my new car. Um, it's, you know, the one thing I wish I could grab and carry out if there was a fire. Uh, the gentleman who makes them is getting older and uh, slowing down and there's quite a wait list on them. You can find them some from time to time, you know, people are selling theirs. But um, anyways, it is my favorite possession. Um, and yeah, it just makes, painting that much more fun. Um, I like to, when I paint, I like to keep the, my brush at about shoulder height. I stand when I paint. Um, I just find I do a better job. Um, and I get away from the painting. I walk away from it so I can get a better sight of it. I can see it better. What's that? What was the name of the easel? Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. So yeah, if you've got the means and you plan to paint very much, you can also, this one's on wheels and I can roll it around the studio just like my, my um, box with all the paints is also on wheels. In fact, most everything in my studio is on wheels. I have laminate, um, fake wood, laminate floors. So it's kind of a very versatile studio. I can move things around um, depending on big projects and different things. Um, my lighting is quite versatile, can move it around. Um, and that's just because I'm doing commissions. My daughter does commissions. Um, so you just, you can change it to fit the project that needs, you know, as you need it. Um, but you can attach these easels to the wall. Uh, unfortunately, my ceiling, I can reach up and touch my ceiling. That's the biggest um, pet peeve I have about my studio. Um, I would love to have, you know, nice tall ceilings because you'll hear this. That's the easel hitting the top of the ceiling as I try to take it up. So I'm not able to use its full height when I paint. So that does mean if I'm painting a great big canvas, 
I may be on my knees painting or ducked down or sitting in a really low chair, um, which is a bummer because if I had vaulted ceilings, I could just stand and paint because this thing can go really tall. Any other questions, you guys, please? Um, oh, and then palette knives, especially for today's project. Uh, we're going to be trying to mix nice, clean colors. Palette knives are immensely easier to clean than brushes. So when mixing clean colors is essential to you, I urge that you, and maybe it's just great practice as we're starting out, to just mix your colors with a palette knife. You'll see me doing it a lot of times with a brush, and that's usually when I'm mixing more grays and browns and colors that I don't need to be as pure. Um, when I need pure colors or you know completely different, like let's say I've been painting really light area and I need to move to a dark area, I will try to you know create that new color using my palette knife. So it is a great habit to get into using your palette knife. It's so easy to fall into the habit of just mixing with the brush all the time and then wondering why you're not getting vibrant, clean, pretty colors. Um, and that's just it. Like at the end of the day, after I thought my brushes are really clean, if I ever decide to clean them with um, Murphy's oil soap at the end of the day, it's amazing how much color still comes out, even when it's not doing that with paint thinner and my towels. So anyways, just a little note there. All right, I'm gonna lay out. I'm gonna try not to kick the camera stand here. Uh, can I move this over a little bit? I'm gonna lay out my first palette. This is the palette I used at the very end of college and my first year plus a little bit out of college. Um, color was an issue for me and my instructor noticed it. Some of you know him, Thomas Kitts was my instructor in college. Still a friend of mine, still a painting buddy of mine and travel guy. We travel together from time to time for shows and different things. So that's just titanium white. Titanium white is my, basically my all the time white. Um, I'm not against other whites, but it's kind of the all arounder. It doesn't crack when it dries like zinc white may. Titanium zinc white is a fantastic white. So if you have that, use it and feel free to use up your zinc white too. But again, titanium white is my all the time. That's just, that's the one I buy. When I, I spend about one third of my painting budget on white paint. Um, when I talk to the manufacturers or the people at Gamblin, they make almost as much white paint as they make all of their other colors combined. And that's because it's, you know, on everybody's palette. It's um, go to my yellow that I'm going to use for this first color wheel and the yellow that I used in the beginning of my career is cadmium yellow light or lemon yellow. They're basically the same. In fact, I don't even notice a difference between the two really. Um, here's a quick note for you guys. The cadmium colors um, were expensive when I was in college and they're just even more and more expensive compared to other colors. I um, do use other colors that I find that work pretty well. Um, I uh, use quite a bit of Hansa colors, Hansa yellow, like here's the Hansa yellow light. Um, you can see that they're basically almost the same. Um, I'll put just a dab of it beside it and you can't see the difference at all. Zoom in there a little. The thing that is different is Hansa is a little bit more transparent than cadmium paints. Anytime you see cadmium in the name, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, cadmium orange, you can basically know that it's gonna be very warm. I mean, very opaque, meaning that it covers very well, has a high pigment load. But if you know my paintings, you know that I like transparency. So I've been pretty lucky in that the Hansa yellow and Hansa colors work out for me pretty well and I save money. Um, hey, Michael? 
Yes. Um, can I just ask, when you see um, paints say cadmium red hue, is that uh, better as far as cost? It will be cheaper. And yeah. all hue means is that it's a fake version of it. Right. Which does not, this paint wants to slide down slowly, so I'm just going to squish it against. Um, hues are great. Do not let the name hue throw you. If you buy them like manganese blue hue is actually the color I use. It's not manganese blue. Manganese blue would be crazy expensive um, just because manganese is a precious, you know, mineral um, metal. I'm not sure which. Um, used in a lot of applications and it's it's really expensive. Manganese blue hue is basically a phthalo color, phthalo blue, a phthalo derivative. Um, for those of you that are brave enough to use phthalo blue, God bless you. For me, I'm too scared and it ruins far more paintings than it helps. So manganese is a kind of, I don't want to say weakened because it's changed, but it is a phthalo derivative. It does a lot of the cool things and vibrant things that phthalos do without destroying. Right. So paint. does this also, um, when you buy a, a hue, does it help you avoid the heavy metals as well? I would hope so. Um, I, I don't know what they're all made out of. Okay. Um, but I would assume that to be the case. Generally, any American brand of paint is desperately trying to be healthy, as healthy as it can. Um, and so I would assume so. Um, so I'm now I'm gonna move to my red, which is cadmium red, um, light or medium are fine for this. Um, a very hot, um, bright red, very strong color. And then my third color, French ultramarine, which is a very dark, um, semi-transparent color. And we will be talking about transparency and opacity of paint more as we move forward. I'm, I'm just kind of mentioning that now, but as we move forward, I will describe that and we'll experiment with it. And in fact, why I did my uh, color wheels like this, that's a permanent marker. I sure hope it is um, underneath that I drew my color wheels with. And um, you'll be able to see the marker through the more transparent colors and the marker will disappear underneath the more opaque colors. So that's a great way to experiment. A lot of times on a piece of paper or whatever, I will just draw a um, line with a permanent marker, take my paint really thickly, and then thin it as I go across and see at what point do I see the black line underneath it. It's a great way to kind of test your colors. All right, so that is my first palette, white, yellow, red, blue. We're gonna ignore white right now. So this is my primary palette that I was taught with. I laid it out in the same way that I laid out the color wheel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of my yellow. All right, we've started painting clean that brush. In fact, I'll just kind of set it aside because it's going to be really hard. This is a great thing about having it in the studio. I've got all my hundreds of paintbrushes so I can, I'll just have a big cleanup job at the end. My cadmium red, look at it, it just covers that permanent marker underneath there, my Sharpie. Put that brush down because I'll be coming back to those. And And 
my French ultramarine. Nice and thick. It's covering up the, uh, the marker. Michael, this is Kim Bonnie. Just an FYI, the camera's focusing on your shoulder. I'm going to move it just to the side a little more so I'm not in front of it quite as much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for letting me know, you guys. Always speak up. This class is for you. And uh, I try to kind of look over at the monitor as I'm painting a little bit to see what you're seeing. But um, just like anything, get lost in the paint. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my in-betweens, right? So from this, my... I'm guessing you guys all know this, but in, you know, yellow and red make orange, red and blue make purple, blue, yellow, green, right? So that, that'll, the green will be here, orange here, purple here. Um, so I'm just gonna grab my yellow, nice and thick, and I'm just gonna kind of bring it across as it meets that yellow. If you want to, like if you want to do a bunch of little circles and mix them independently so that you have, uh, you know, little clean circles of color as they mix and go towards each other, that's fine. I'm also going to take, since I've got my yellow paint out and my yellow brush and it's nice and clean, I'm also going to go towards my green. All right. Grab my red. I'm going to try to do this all pretty quickly because I know that it's not the most interesting and you guys have all learned this, a, you know, time or two before, but again, this is a, me explaining why I've changed my palette or why I've added to my palette. Now I'm going to bring that red over towards here. Now I've touched the yellow. You can see very quickly as it's starting to change. So zoom in on that orange a little bit there. Makes a very nice orange. I'm going to go ahead and make a nice clean pile of that here. Pretty nice, pretty good orange. Now I'm going to grab my blue brush and I'm going to bring my blue towards the red. There they're touching and it should be making what color? Purple. But instead it's making a god awful dark brownie plum color. Make a little pile of that so you can kind of see. It makes a horrendous, not purple. Anybody want to tell me why that happened? Why did this red and blue not make purple? Because you still have yellow. Oh, you guys are awesome. All right, one at a time. This is Kim Bonnie because the CAD red really does, has a lot more yellow in it. Nailed it. Perfect. Anybody else have anything to add to that? I'm going to clean my blue brush because I'm going towards the yellow now. I don't want any of that red from the purple. So just quickly dipped it in my paint thinner and making sure I don't have any contaminants. Um, it's nice and clean. Grab this blue. And I'm, I'm not going to use as much blue because the, the yellow, even though it is a cadmium color, is much, always know that it is a weaker pigment load or a weaker pigment. It makes a nice green, 
but it is not a vibrant green. Anybody want to tell me why that is? The blue has red in it. Yeah, you got it. That's right. So the simple question be, well, why don't I use a pure yellow, a pure red, and a pure blue? Because then surely I would be able to make a nice purple, a nice green, and a nice orange. But the fact is, in oil paints, we just don't have that. A cadmium blue, I mean, I'm sorry, a cobalt blue would be probably a, a better blue than this French ultramarine that I was taught to use. Um, and, you know, maybe a slightly less orangey red may be nice. But I found that, you know, it just doesn't quite do it. And in fact, you know, this weird brown plum color, I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit of um, white to that so you can see kind of where that color went to. It's so dark that it's hard to see. Um, so it is purple E, but it's primarily, it's much more gray. Um, so anyways, after working with that, and this green is fantastic for landscape painting. It's, you know, actually tr truer, especially in the Oregon Pacific Northwest, you know, New York areas. It's much more um, olivey because of that little bit of red. So it's very useful in plein air painting and painting landscapes. Um, but, you know, if you want to paint some spring greens or you know, golf course greens or, you know, vibrant, vibrant greens, you're just not able to do it. So you can do a huge amount with this. And there's still times when I want to pack lightly when I go out painting, I just want to throw it into a little tiny bag, carry as, you know, I'm going to hike, I want to carry the least amount of weight. Or, I'm, you know, it's all about fitting it into my suitcase. There, I'll still go to this palette and be able to do a huge amount. But over the years of teaching this, and again, feeling like a, a liar, as I'm like, okay, kids, or adults, or college kids, or whatever, we're going to make a color wheel, and we're going to make, you know, we're going to use the primaries to make secondaries, and it just doesn't really happen. Um, I began to, you know, first experiment, well, what if I used a different blue, a different red, a different yellow, and found, you know what, it just doesn't get there. Um, there's a book out there called Yellow and Blue Doesn't Make Green, um, which I've not read, <laughs> uh, but in it, I've read sections of it, and it, that's kind of where my idea for having a split primary comes from. So now what I did is I added a second yellow, a second red, and a second blue. So I added a more orangey yellow. This is Hansa Yellow Deep, Cad Yellow Medium would work, or Cadmium Yellow Deep. And I want these colors to be related. They're both yellow, but on the color wheel, they're actually kind of far apart, like in color space. And I'll post a um, picture with where things exist in color space later. I added a second red, which had a lot more blue in it. Um, this is quinacridone red. Alizarin red would be my other option, or I would use alizarin permanent, which in all actuality is actually a quinacridone color. Um, true alizarin paint does not, is not light fast. It's one of the least light fast colors that you can buy is true alizarin. Um, they found that, you know, in the old icons and stuff that the alizarin is completely gone from the paintings. Um, but alizarin permanent is a quinacridone derivative and it's much more uh, light safe. My other color I added, wipe my fingers here. Um, is a blue, this is the manganese blue hue, that leans towards green. 
this one seems like it's going to be slippery so wants to slide down that's the only downside to having a horizontal palette is uh, oil paints are like slow moving slugs with their oil in there want to slowly creep down my palette um so now i'm going to slide it so it's a little more right in front of the camera you can see very quickly that i have one yellow that leans towards green one yellow that leans towards orange, right? It's already kind of going towards orange. I have a red now that leans towards orange, a red that leans towards purple, a blue that wants that leans towards purple, and a blue that leans towards green. So I'm assuming you guys can already kind of instinctually see the value there. You can kind of pick up. So that's what the second palette or um, color wheel is going to be. And I'll just quickly add the colors that I have on this brush already, which is my red. So I'm thinking my orange is going to be here. My purple is going to be here and my green is going to be there. So I'm going to put the red that leans towards orange in this circle. I'll go ahead and bring it out a little bit. I read that leans towards purple, my quinacridone. And so the truth is, the more I use this palette, the more I can use other colors. Like if I'm in a country that doesn't have the particular colors or I can't read the particular colors, my main thing is I want is a red that leans towards orange and a red that leans towards purple. So that's why a lizard crimson would work fine or cadmium red medium versus cadmium red light or any of the other, you know, polythra of red colors that and I don't even know what, you know, the vermilions and uh, anyway, so I just looked through my drawer, I've got tons of different names. Um, all right. I'm trying to keep my uh, my brushes a little bit straight so I can don't have to clean so much during painting time here. So now I'm going to put my blue, the French ultramarine that leans towards purple. It's going to be a little bit hard to see because it's going to make a very dark. In fact, that French ultramarine is reading really darkly on the monitor. Um, What's the difference between French ultramarine blue and just ultramarine blue? As far as I know, nothing. I think it might be a brand thing. Not a very good transition there. So. so you can see that again, it's made a very dark color, but I'm going to add white to that color. I'll just do it right underneath it. And it's made a much, compare that to that, right? And so, I mean, try to paint beautiful irises, bearded irises with this. It will make you sad. <laughs> this will make you happy. All right, now I'm gonna go to my blue that leads from green. I should have just had all my brushes out. my manganese blue. This is a transparent color. You can see as I try to cover, you can literally see the um, pen right through it. I'll put it on thickly. And I can still, I don't know if you guys can see it in the monitor, but I can still see it through. And excuse my reach for a second here as I take it over here. You can definitely see the line underneath there, right? Everybody see that? Michael, um, yes. it's Jean, and I don't, I, I don't have any manganese. Can I use the cerulean? Cerulean is a fantastic color, yeah. Cerulean is, in fact, thank you for asking that. 
Cerulean, in fact, is the color I used in manganese blue hue, manganese blue hues space for years. And in fact, it was in teaching at Clark College where a student did the inverse, said, I don't have cerulean. Can I use manganese blue hue? And I you know, didn't even know very much about the color. I said, sure. Um, and in watching over the student's shoulder, I went, oh my goodness, that color is fantastic. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as I put on my yellow here. I'm gonna put my yellow that leads towards um, green, which is again, the lemon yellow or the cadmium yellow light. What I found was I could never make cerulean as vibrant, oops, as vibrant as manganese, but I could make manganese as subdued as, as, uh, what's the color again? Cerulean. What? Cerulean. No, uh, it, as the other blue anyway, we were just talking about. Um, Ultramarine. No, the one you just asked about, the blue that you wanted to use instead of the manganese. Cerulean. Cerulean, cerulean. yes, yeah, cerulean. I heard vermilion, sorry, as cerulean. Um, I, I can make this color subdued and make it do the things that cerulean does. but I couldn't do the inverse. And the same thing happened with quinacridone red versus alizarin crimson, because for years and years, you know, all my instructors had told me to use alizarin crimson. Um, and then the first time a student brought in quinacridone red instead um, and asked if I could use it, they could use it. Um, they put a little bit down and uh, I, I went over and I added some white to it and was like, that is crazy, horrible. Like, why would I ever need that bright of a pink? You know, little did I know I'd have a daughter a couple years later, but um, it makes the most bright and exciting pink that I'd ever seen, but cool, a cool yet very vibrant pink. Let's see if I have some alizarin crimson so I can just show you side by side. Um, I may not even have any anymore. It's been so long since I've used it. Oh, interesting. If you have both quinacridone and alizarin, um, ah, that one. All right. I'll go ahead and lay this out beside it. There's how the alizarin appears. It's quite dark. And, uh, and then I'm going, I'll go ahead and mix that with white. So I actually fought using quinacridone because I just, I was like, man, I don't need that bright, bright, bright pink. So you can see quite the difference in vibrancy. It's just a much more subdued pink. Michael, you, what is that red that you're mixing now with white? Crimson or Liz, or Liz. Mm -hmm. So that is the color that I used a long time until I found out quinacridone. But then what I realized, just like the manganese blue, is I could subdue it and make it do all the things that cerulean did but i could never make cerulean do the things that manganese does so that was the same thing with um the alizarin versus the quinacridone the quinacridone i can make it do what alizarin does but i can't make alizarin like you can't ever make this color much more vibrant it's you know whenever you mix you're subduing a color to a degree um, but by simply adding just a touch of French ultramarine 
to this. I can make it very similar to uh, the quinacridone. I mean, sorry, a lizard. So I could make my quinacridone do what a lizard does, but I could not make my lizard do what quinacridone does. So in my goal of having a fairly simple palette, because you're going to learn a lot faster if you're using less colors. If you're using a huge palette, you know, 20 colors laid out, it's much more difficult to learn each one of their properties than if you have a few colors, because then you can replicate your results. If you're like a mad scientist, just throwing all these different chemicals together, 20 different things together, and something exciting happens, trying to backtrack and figure out how did I get to that can be very difficult. So that's why I suggest uh, learning with that limited palette, if it's this one or whichever one you choose, and then adding a color as you get comfortable, adding another color as you get comfortable. It takes a little bit of time, but it will add, it will speed up your learning process in the long run. All right, I just need to clean a new brush here so I can get to my orange. Because I want to get to the yellows, I want to make sure I got a nice clean brush. So I'm going to my, oops, need to zoom back out a little bit. I'm going to go to my orangey yellow, my cadmium yellow medium, or cadmium yellow deep, or Hansa yellow deep in this instance. It's fairly transparent, so it should probably show the permanent marker underneath it pretty quickly. And I'm getting towards the orange here. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see, makes a really nice bright orange. All right, so instantly by adding three more colors, I've added a huge amount of um, brilliance and <clears throat> excitement to my palette. What I put this other color wheel underneath for is you can make an orange with my quinacridone and my lemon yellow, and that's what I was gonna do here. My green could be with my um, orangey yellow and my French ultramarine. And my purple, I can make with, you know, these colors and bring them together. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead to make sure we have enough time. But what will happen, and you'll see it, is they'll become much more brown as they meet in the middle because they have hints of the other color. Um, so, yeah, and that's going to be a big, big point. And I posted the, um, the quote on the... Facebook page about um, got too heavy of a weight on here, so it's kind of sinking. Um, every color is friends with its neighbor, meaning all these colors get along really well. They're easy to mix. They're going to stay very vibrant, but a lover of its opposite. And if ever you want to subdue a color, like let's say I made this really nice vibrant purple, you know, and I put it where I wanted it, but I need a lot of areas with the more subdued purple. I, I'm going to look across the color wheel to the yellow and bring those together, and I will subdue that purple very, very quickly. Learning to mix across your color wheel is one of the greatest things you can do. And all of the colors that exist in this space in the middle of the color wheel are my favorites. These colors are all very dramatic and very exciting and you know, would definitely draw our eyes towards them. You know, the colors that exist on the outside of the color wheel, but it's all of the beautiful browns, grays, and you know, 
colors that have been mixed that I call them the colors without names, right? Those are where most of my painting exists. I very rarely have strong, strong, strong primaries or even strong, strong, strong secondaries in my paintings. I often wanna reserve those colors for real impact. There's a lot of painters out there that paint with very vibrant, very pure colors. And that's fun. You know, I, I call that a fiesta. All the paintings out here is a fiesta. That's the party. All the colors in here is the siesta. That's where we get calm and relaxed and nice harmonies, right? I mean, some people can get away with these colors being, you know, the colors of their home. And you walk in and you're like, wow, this house is fun and exciting. You know, maybe down in, you know, the Southern countries and stuff, they've got these really beautiful, exciting, dramatic houses um, with bright, bright primaries and secondaries. Um, but, you know, for the most part, uh, homes are done in grays and browns and a little more sleepy, a little more comfortable. It doesn't make your blood pressure up quite as high all the time. All right. So this is basically the palette that this class is going to be taught on with some exceptions and we'll do some experimenting, but the split primary palette, you can really decide which colors you would like to put in those places. And I even urge you to kind of experiment with uh, trying different colors and seeing what orange, you know, your different yellows and different reds and seeing what oranges you get to. But this, I found this has, you know, hundreds of colors that I can mix. This has thousands and thousands of colors that I can mix using six tubes of color and white. I can also make black basically with my French ultramarine, basically with this palette, you can almost see it here. I can make a really, really dark color. I very rarely use black. I'm not anti-black as a color at all. I, you know, I do use it and I do like it, but I found if I force myself to mix my darks, then I look closer at the shadow dark areas and I, then I'm forcing myself to see the colors within there. Is it leaning towards more of a purpley shadow color? Is it leaning towards a really dark greeny color or even really there can be warm shadows and I think we short circuit our brain, not short circuit, we just take a short cut and we um, don't give the shadows their due. There's so many beautiful dark colors. So by forcing ourselves to mix them, we force ourselves to look at them. And by forcing ourselves to look at them, we can see the beauty that is in the darks and shadow areas. So I urge you to try mixing your own darks versus just adding black to everything. All right, now we're gonna quickly jump to the Zorn palette over here. All right, um, the Zorn palette is a really fun challenge and I wanted to ask you guys possibly, we can, you don't have to decide now, if we would like to do a painting based on the Zorn palette. The neat thing and um, Zorn palette, the reason it's called that is it's based on a painter, Anders Zorn. Um, you can look him up, who was uh, mythologized basically to have painted with this palette almost exclusively. And the reason is, is that he, um, he, uh, his self portraits, he's carrying, holding a palette that basically contains variations. And these aren't the exact colors, but very close. Uh, here, speaking of black, I've just put black on there. Um, so that is black, yellow ochre, and he would use a vermilion red, um, which I don't own. So I went with a cadmium red medium. So I will add my yellow ochre to my yellow spot. I'm gonna bring that down towards the nice warm red and take it over towards my black. Michael, what color of black are you using? There are several. 
in an ideal world, I would be using a Mars black is closer to what he used. I don't have that. I mean, I can look one more time. But I think I'm, this is an ivory black. Yeah, I don't have Mars black. Um, so if you have Mars black, that would be closer to the true Zorn palette. Um, and if I were not trying to replicate him, like if I was just showing you as if I made up this palette, because it's a beautiful palette, I would actually be using Payne's gray. I love Payne's gray. It's a very dark gray. Actually, what I can do, I'm going to mix the Payne's gray and the ivory black, just as an example, because I think that should make closer to a Mars black. Mars black is a very, very dark cool black. Um, Payne's gray, as in the name, is not all the way to black, but it's very, very dark, and it's also very cool. Um, add a little white to it, and you can see that it wants to lean towards blue right away. versus the ivory black, which is just a little bit warmer. It's probably gonna be kind of hard to see that on the monitor. Um, but when I look at it closely, my ivory black is just a touch warmer than my Payne's gray, or if I had Mars black. Um, so I'm gonna add my red. Take that over here and over here. So it makes an orange ish color. You get to use a lot of ishes in my class, a lot of. It's not quite orange, but it's probably closer to orange than most any other color that it would be uh, mistaken for. So it's orange-ish. Putting on the black here. And because the black leans towards blue, it makes a very interesting subdued gray green. Clean if that you say the black you're using is Mars black or Payne's gray? <laughs> it is. A truly a combination of Payne's gray and ivory black because I don't own Mars black or I couldn't find it if I do own it. So I'm going to take a little bit of that. So, and you could try it with different blacks, um, whichever you have. Don't go out and buy just for this. Can, uh, can we use the Payne's gray or do we need a black? No, I would love the Payne's gray. Yeah, if you have that, use it. It's so, I love Payne's gray. And that's actually a new color to me too. Maybe even somebody in this class that introduced me to that last year. And I've been going crazy with Payne's Gray lately. I use it as my blue in paintings quite a bit just to make these really subtle. Um, if anybody saw a recent painting I did of some cattails, that was using Payne's Gray as my blue. I saw and that one, it's beautiful. Isn't that fantastic? And it just has oh, so much harmony. I love it. I, I looked at it and I thought, oh, I wish I painted that. <laughs> well, good, because you're gonna if you want to. Um, I love this. And in painting with this, um, this has really opened me up. And we're actually going to do an exercise uh, probably on the third or fourth class where you're going to use a different palette. It's gonna be three colors, one red, one yellow, one blue. 
and you get to decide which of those and you can go crazy and i'll even let you guys decide on which um we did for that um in the last class on design we actually did that and i had the students pick my colors to paint this um and if i remember right it was french ultramarine yellow ochre and a lizard or the quinacridone red and white if i if i remember correctly um and you can see there's still so much color and what's really neat is even though you don't have a true green or a true orange is when you cover a surface your brain will read these colors um i'm gonna if i put this gray that we mixed well it's not showing up on the gray palette very quickly i'm gonna put it on top of this red zoom in there and the gray will appear to be blue see that because of what it's next to our eyes will fill it in so it's really interesting when you do a painting with this palette you will have people that will swear you used blue just because the our eyes fill all that in all right so there we go that is our version of the Zorn palette. Um, but it is a lot of fun to just challenge yourself. Um, a palette I've been loving using is um, Payne's Gray, Indian Yellow, and Quinacridone Red, or Earth Red, or like kind of the Indian Red, kind of a brownie red as my uh, tri colors, and does a lot of really, really neat things. Um, a lot of you guys have seen me do my underpaintings, my sketching with Indian yellow, earth red, French ultramarine. They're all very transparent and it makes a really beautiful glowy underpainting. Um, maybe I can share some from the previous class of your guys' sky paintings that you did. Oh, here's mine. I never got back to finishing it. But you can see a lot of the glowiness and how much color you can get just using that. Um, all right, last but not least, I talked to you guys a little bit about the CMYK, right? That our printer uses, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. This is a strange one. So again, after lots of experimenting, trying to figure out, I, I thought, of course, it's got to be manganese. That is the, um, let's get, throw all my paint brushes in the paint thinner here. I need new brushes for this. Um, I thought for sure it was manganese, quinacridone red, and then the lemon yellow that would do it. But it really did not um, live up to what I wanted. So after much experimenting and trying different things, now I'm using Hansa Yellow Light or yeah, Hansa Yellow Light. Clean this off. Nothing worse. So if you guys have problems with your paint tubes getting all gunked up, before you put the cap back on, just uh, give them a wipe down. Ah, man. It's funny how oil paints go everywhere. Um, and then the lids don't want to go back on. Okay, then my red, this is the weird one. And I had to actually go out and buy new tubes of paint that I hadn't used before to um, figure this out. This is quinacridone magenta. So I found a magenta color. It's like quinacridone red. Here, I'll put it next to it. It's very slimy, but uh, you can see it's darker and it wants to be even more purple. It's a beautiful color, but I 
figured I, I thought I could probably make that color with quinacridone red and a little bit of French ultramarine. But for this, I found this to be the best. Now, here's the weird one for me. The blue, the, uh, the cerulean or the CMYK, the blue, I found uh, cobalt teal. And I had to call Gamblin and talk to Scott Galatly over there, one of the paint manufacturers, and figure out a color. Look at that color. It's so beautiful, but it is so foreign to me. And when I bought it, I was like, well, no, he's surely wrong. That doesn't, that's not blue. How is that going to make blue? Right? Isn't that weird, you guys? Plus black again. I would add black where I need it to darken the colors in this instance. Um, I would probably, I need to go out and experiment and try using this in plain air and see what happens. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but uh, so far in my experimenting, I've, uh, I'm really considering possibly changing my manganese over to a cobalt teal, which is um, not as transparent at all. Um, I have my colors here, so I got my Hansi Yellow Light. I'm going to set them aside so I don't mistake the names. Hansi Yellow Light I'm going to put on here. It's quite transparent. You're going to see the lines underneath it quite quickly as I go towards my magenta. Come back up, pick some, take that towards my cobalt. I know that this um, Hansa light is a quite weak color. So I'm going to go ahead and add just a little more because these other colors are pretty strong. So I don't want it to get washed away completely as I'm mixing the other colors on there. Set that brush aside. You guys still with me? I haven't lost anybody yet. I'm trying to make this interesting and fun. And I've never done this where I kind of walk through the whole cycle of how I've gone about choosing my colors. So thank you for letting me at least take a uh, ride down memory lane here. Um, and I think this is gonna be so invaluable for me to have up in my studio at all times. Um, you know, I, I could almost frame this. Um, all right, so now I'm putting down my quinacridone magenta. Very dark, quite transparent. I can see the line underneath it a little bit as I take it away. You'll be able to see the line, the pen line underneath. Yeah. Now I'm going to take it towards my Hansa yellow light. Michael, if you uh, question, if you just have a magenta, I want to say purple, a magenta, rather than a quinacridone, is that a good replacement, just magenta? It's not a great one, but it's fine. Yeah, experiment with it. Try it. It'll you'll get a much more purpley. You'll get prettier, easier purples. But you're gonna have a hard time making um, brighter, warmer colors with it. That's my assumption. All right. So my orange in this instance isn't quite as bright as I remembered it being. Oh, and I bet you, you know why? I bet you because it's so transparent, it's sitting on top of that gray. So I'm gonna try to make a good pile. I'm, again, just assuming, maybe this would have been better on a white surface. Excuse me, Michael, has it ever mattered which direction you take it? If you go from yellow to the magenta or magenta to the yellow in terms of the way it mixes, or is it irrelevant? It is irrelevant, but it does matter when you're glazing. So if I put down a very fine, um, smooth surface of the yellow, let that dry, and then glazed in with the cornacridone magenta, it'd be different color slightly than if I did it the opposite way. So that's a fun thing to experiment as we move forward. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a decent pile of orange out of this and see 
if it's a little more vibrant, if I make it thicker. Huh. Maybe I used a different yellow last time. Because I remember it being a little more vibrant. Maybe uh, if I were to do this again, maybe I would actually use a cadmium yellow light and see because I guess I can still. There it is as a thick paint. So that's definitely brighter. So it's the gray of the panel showing through that's kind of neutralizing the color because they're so transparent. Um, very quickly, just a sidebar here. I'm gonna take that up and I'm gonna try it with the uh, Uh, cadmium instead. Can you guys see that? Am I still on the screen? Yeah. It's a little bit more vibrant, but not a whole lot. So anyways, there we go. Always fun to, and that's the neat thing about having all these colors laid out is I can just do quick experiments, quick trying of new things. Um, and that's why I don't get tired of doing these things. I've done basically every color class I've ever taught. I've done color wheels and I love it every time. I love watching color bend. I love watching it change as it you know moves around. And then we're not even doing my favorite part of that mixing towards the middle. Oh, that just it really makes me as you can tell excited and happy i love teaching color classes but look at that that is not my idea of blue that is so bright i mean it is blue it's my dream of blue water like that color what that color is, is that Caribbean blue right that is where we all wish we were right after class because we wouldn't want to miss class but go sit on a beach and look at water that color. All right, I'm going to take that crazy color towards my yellow. And I'm going to take it towards my magenta. And watch this is what blew my mind. Makes unbelievably beautiful purples but here is where it gets crazy it makes blue here isn't that weird so by it's like, it's like my color wheel has been shifted over. That becomes that at this point. You guys see that okay? Is that big enough? Maybe I can zoom in. I don't know. I assume you're all on mute and I just missed all your gasps of amazement. But for me, that was just beyond weird. I'm sorry, I missed, I had an emergency phone call. What blue did you start with? That was cobalt teal ah, bending towards the quinacridone. And it really does make, oh, just beautiful purples. Let's see if I can. It's so yeah. funny. That's the one I wanted to ask you about. I'm holding it in my hand. Aha, ask away. It is so beautiful, but it does. It's going to take more experimenting on my part before it becomes a regular guest because you know, I just don't understand its properties yet. I would like to just take it aside, maybe do some abstracts with it. I use it a lot in the Bahamas. It yeah, really- I imagine so. And that's like probably why I never bought it. I was like, oh, I wish I got to paint with that color, but you know, I just don't get to. I don't see that water very often. Maybe if I went to like Clear Bottom Lake or somewhere, you know, you might see some of these, um, you know, like when, uh, the water comes right out of the ground and some of the springs and it's just got that vibrant, vibrant sky blue color because it's, you know, oxygenated and all those things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring it back one more time because I'm having too much fun. Let's 
This is Kim Bonnie, just a, a geeky thing. That color is made by copper sulfite or sulfate, sulfite. Copper sulfate. In water, um, if you go, um, yeah, if you happen to go down like the Grand Canyon and go to the side springs, it's copper sulfate, so, sulfite. It's also one of the ice or the eights. I'm getting confused, but yes. But I wonder, huh? That makes me wonder what you know in the Bahamas. It's the white sand reflecting the clear blue skies. I assume. Um, but oh my God, I just love this transition. And now I just want to add a little bit of white to that transition just because we're having so much fun. Thank you guys for letting me geek out on this for just a second. Again, when I do my purples, oftentimes I like to add white just to see Can you zoom out just a little? Thank you, yeah. Zoom out and I can lift this up a touch. Look at that. Uh, it's like painting with jewels, gems. Beautiful. A whole new world of iris painting has just opened up to all of us. <laughs> I've used it just in touches in the sky and find it's just a magnificent addition. You know what? That's where I've been using it too. Um, oh, that is just something special. All right. Well, maybe this will be the class where I change my color palette up, up again a little bit. But I wanted to show you guys this experimenting and I'm always experimenting. I'm always trying new things. I want to get comfortable. I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I guess saying I'm always experimenting. That's not the case because I want to understand the colors so that I can, when I introduce a new friend and new interesting things are happening, I can figure out how to replicate them. That palette is so interesting because you can get both really brights and also muted darks. That's a great point. Yeah, let's see what happens when we mix all three colors, shall we? Because that would be the way I get a really dark color in the first palette that I showed you would be just mixing those three. Um, where should I do it? Oh, hold on one second. I'm gonna need two hands. My Easel just uh, moved. All right, great. Sorry, I had to tighten down. I'm going to zoom back out. And we're going to mix all three colors and see what happens. I haven't even done that yet, which is interesting. I'll do it right. I'll do it down here. blue because I added probably too much. So that's kind of our dark purple over here. And, and I'll take photos of all this with my iPhone and slightly better light and post those onto the page. And I'm going to add just a touch. When I add a yellow to any mixture to make it dark, I just add a little bit. Basically what I do is try to mix as dark a purple as I can, and then add just a touch of yellow. And all that yellow does, just like any other time we mix from across the color wheel, is neutralize it. Yeah, just took it right to a gray. It's not the darkest dark color by any means. So I imagine that's why our computers need black to mix. Let me add a little white to that and see what kind of gray we made. It's almost a Payne's gray. Yeah, it's even, yeah. 
it's like a navy blue but again i could alter that with by adding more blue or more yellow or whatever so here it's saying it's quite purple um get rid of that white so the camera can see it <laughs> there just seems to be so much more life to this palette than yeah. the other ones yeah isn't that weird um i mean i don't know if weird's the right way to say it but i think that this could be part of the future of my color palette for sure and again it's like okay how do i incorporate it do i still have a split primary but maybe these become my this this takes the place of quinoc or manganese blue this takes the place of my alizarin red and this takes you know or you know i can keep that yellow and maybe that's what happens um or maybe i have three blues three reds and two yellows um i don't know there's nothing wrong with adding more colors to this palette but i want to understand this palette as I do, I would probably just do this color first, play for a while, paint for a couple of weeks, and then maybe I could include another one. Um, and in fact, when I lay my palette out, I my color that is not part of my normal palette, generally, I even put to a different side. I'll actually have all my colors up here, my white, lemon yellow, cad yellow medium, cad red medium, quinacridone, French ultramarine, manganese, because I lay them out like a color wheel, except for in a straight line to, to utilize space. And then I actually will usually put my guest colors on this side, just because I want to make sure I'm not accidentally dipping into them, that it's a conscious choice. Um, it's not very friendly of me, right? I keep them out of the family, but uh, they get to hang out over here. They're the guest colors. And um, Indian yellow is one that sneaks in a lot. I use Indian yellow instead of when, uh, cadmium yellow medium or dark uh, a lot um, so that's actually replacing it more and more um, but I have found it a little bit difficult to teach Indian yellow in a class setting because it is a very odd color and it, it reacts differently um, with different colors so it doesn't mix um, as expected all the time but for those of you um, who took this class to learn my dirty little secrets. Indian yellow is one of my big dirty little secrets. And uh, earth red is one of my big secret colors or one of my other guest colors that gets used a lot. So there's no secrets in my classes. Anything I know, I will try to share if it's pertinent. Um, but I just, I, ah, I hate when I take workshops and classes and the teacher says, oh, that's my secret, as if I'm going to steal it and become him or the, her. Um, so no secrets in my class. So anything you want to ask. Um, I wish I would make this even prettier and didn't have all my little experiments and everything else. And I would still love to do this middle color wheel. But uh, that was the first hour and a half of class. And uh, so all I want is this color wheel. These are bonus for you. Um, if you come up with any other try or uh, colors like this and you're experimenting and you think they're fun, share them with the class on the Facebook page. And again, I will post these. Uh, this just makes me, look at it, it's even a smiley face. Um, makes me happy. Um, this is gonna be fun. Let's take five, uh, a little over five minute break um so i can clean this craziness up and uh i'm going to what i'll be doing is replacing the color wheels with this which again is just a board same thing i just put blue tape over the top to make five little scenes to paint um my goal is to see if i can do five of them and we're just going to uh do a straight blue sky basic basic and then experimenting on that theme. I guess this was kind of my thought is that I do two upright and four hor or three horizontal. This one's a panoramic, I guess, because I'm bad at taping. Um, and uh, there we go. 
Um, this is just a cheap way to do a lot of paintings that I won't care about because I mean, I guess if they really, really work out, I could cut them out and do something with them. But all right, it is quarter after. I will see you guys at a little after 20 after because it's going to take me more than five minutes and I desperately need um, some warm coffee, not cold coffee. All right, break. Alexa, play Greg Maroney. The playlist, Greg Maroney on Amazon Music. Alexa, volume five.
Michael, this is Kim Bonnie. Um, again, did I hear you right saying that we should make little painting surfaces with cardboard for the bulk of the lessons this uh, session? somebody talking but I was downstairs yeah it's Kim Bonnie I just wanted to validate that you had suggested that for the bulk of the uh, lessons this session that we create our own um, surfaces just using cardboard did I hear that right uh, I mean these are just the backings from um, the thing that I just painted on and this are backings from frames you know when you get frames with glass in them they have like a piece of cardboard in there I just use those. Um, if you want to use canvases or whatever you want to paint on, this is just a cheap option and it makes it so I don't, you know, care too much. It's not, I'm not spending money. Um, Which, you know, I'm a total fan of. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you're just experimenting and trying things because inevitably I notice like when I have a, you know, I have a hundred sketch pads, but when I pull out my sketch pad where I know every page costs a dollar, I'm a lot more uh, tight than if it's just a, you know, newsprint. I will experiment and play a lot more and just rip it out and throw it away a lot more readily. So I, I want you to, I, whatever you're comfortable with, really, um, I just wanted to give you an option of a way to make it inexpensive if you wanted to. No, I dig that. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to just so up some flat cardboard I have in the garage. Great. Yeah, a really good surface is um, mat boards from frame shops. They, you know, they cut out the middle part to make the mats and they will usually just give those to you or um, sell them to you for like a quarter. And they're great and they're generally acid free. You know, cardboard's got a lot of acid in it that will eventually change the colors of your paint. Um, contaminate your paint. So um, mat boards, I have a whole stack of them here that my daughter does all her <laughs> experimenting on. Um, like here, this is just a red mat board. Um, and this is just the middle, you know, they cut out the four by six format mat. And then this is just the middle that's left. It has a white side and that, and I would just gesso that to paint on it or throw some acrylic paint maybe on top of it. You can let that dry and that's a pretty good painting surface. Um, but those are great just for little experiments. My daughter uses these, um, again, she's been doing a lot of commissions lately. Um, let me show you what she's been doing, it's pretty wild. Check this out. So she's selling these and that's actually lavender that she attaches to them. Um, let me see if I can find the other one. Uh, so she paints the lavender, some of them. These ones were left plain, but she paints lavender and puts them on and the uh, people basically tell her the colors that they want and she paints them to match whatever she, they want. Um, totally cool. If I was still teaching middle school, That's I would totally do that. So yeah, these, so this one is the inverse. It's, she painted the lavender green and the background purple, and it goes together as a set with the purple lavender with the green. So anyway, she does a lot of color little comps, sends those to the client to test, you know, like this one's too purple. They want more of a gray purple. So she's redoing this one. Um, 
they love this one. And uh, anyway, so she's always doing color experimenting and playing as well. And so she's really learned the importance of doing little tiny color comps um, on those. Uh, I don't see, she usually has, a, they're probably under her pile of stuff right now, but she has a whole stack of little tiny, here's one of my favorites that I stole from her. Cause I'm like, don't touch it, I want this one. These were two of my favorites that she did, again, on the map board. Um, I just love this so very much as an abstract little painting. And this one, just the bluey grays and all of that. Um, but yeah, she has tons and tons of these that she just tries different colors on. What a clever girl. You must be really proud of her. I have to go to the frame store today, as a matter of fact, so I'm going to ask them about their Matt leftovers. Yeah. And if you ever go to um, Oregon Society of Artists, they had a uh, hundred pounds of it donated to them. And just tell them I sent you. Well, not me. That's not likely. I'm in San Francisco. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. Then your frame shop. <laughs> yeah. Really quickly, you guys. As we're, oh, Alexa, stop. Let me do a quick. Um, I guess I'm just going to assume that everybody's back because we went a little bit long on that break. Um, this is the uh, cattail painting that I did that I was telling you guys about. This has no blue in it. Um, it's Payne's gray is my blue. And there's a lot of color going on. Um, this was a very interesting, I used uh, gold ochre, quinacridone, Payne's gray, and I think I use sap green, just a touch um, in this. And uh, I actually did three of these paintings because I was having so much fun. This is another instance where I laid out two of them side by side and painted on them both back to for, uh, side by side. I sold uh, two of them already. Um, but anyways, a lot of fun and then really nice kind of interesting glow, kind of a misty day. And this is uh, cattails that are about a block from my studio here. Really so, beautiful. Excited for those to come back this year. The beavers, it's a guy's property and he's got a beaver problem and they dam up. They literally clog the pipe that goes under the road and turn his yard into what I think is just unbelievably beautiful little marsh. And he's constantly, he doesn't want to kill the beavers, but he keeps having to destroy the dam Plus the water will end up going over the road, uh, but it's pretty fun. I love because that's part of uh, one of the walk routes that my wife and I take. And I'm always so excited when I see the beavers down there doing their thing and changing the environment. Um, so I never know what's going to grow there year to year. It depends on what's, what the beavers have done. Um, I basically took all the colors instead of scraping them off. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and just put them kind of as if, if you can imagine that it was a color wheel. So it's the yellows, the reds. I pulled the yellow ochre down a little bit because it's kind of a browner color. So it's already been mixed. And then the blues, this is my Payne's gray over here. Um, I'm gonna pull up really quickly, just for my reference, the uh, sky that I sent you guys in the, Plain blue sky. It's on the Facebook page. Um, and if you look closely at it, it, you know, plain blue skies generally are kind of boring to me. I don't paint them very often. Um, this is a plain air painting that I did out on Sabi Island. And that's about as plain a blue sky as I will often do. But you'll still see that it's got bands of color that go up as it changes. Um, unfortunately, this, I never finished this painting. It's still pretty flat and doesn't have a lot of stuff. But it was sure fun to see the, the grasses out there you know, changing. I think this is early fall. Um, and there's thousands and thousands of geese. Salve Island is a protected bird 
refuge near Portland. Um, but anyways, I'm going to show these kind of these bands of colors on this one here. And then we're going to begin to experiment with that um, and showing transitions. So I just grabbed a couple of my paintings from around the studio here. This is a um, hard to see, fairly plain, but you can still see within the sky. It's a very wispy, almost not there clouds um, on a kind of foggy, cool morning. You still see kind of the band of color on the horizon as it's going up. Of course, where the sun is in the sky is greatly going to change the bands of color, but it's in understanding kind of where, you know, how color exists in the sky as a general rule, as a general guideline that we will then be able to start pushing and really experimenting with this very shiny, sorry, but another cool uh, kind of a sunrise um, with the fog and stuff still sitting. This is a, another bird refuge, the other direction from my house. I'm pretty lucky I'm surrounded by some pretty good nature areas. Um, this is Tualatin Bird, Tualatin River Refuge. Um, but anyways, the bands of color are generally the same. They just get exaggerated, again, depending on where the light is. This is kind of a gray sky with some pinks kind of bleeding up through it. Uh, this one was all about the transition of the gray, cool foreground to the warm sky and the transparent uh, warming leaves. Um, this is one I'm working on right now, waiting for it to dry so I can add some color into the waves. Um, I think some of you may have saw it on my Facebook page, which is, I think, Michael Orwick Arts. Um, but the bands of color still exist. They're just exaggerated. So by learning the basic, you then know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you can look for it. Um, see the bands of color, ignore maybe the clouds, you can see kind of the warm going up and then getting back towards a kind of a red, purpley or blue gray as it goes up. So uh, these are kind of like my experiments. This was actually painted using the leftover paint from after a day of painting. I just saw these kind of beautiful purples and thought, man, that deserves to be something as opposed to just being the extra paint being thrown in the garbage. And I really like that. I really like the energy that I attacked it with um, and everything else. So uh, one more. This one's another one kind of in progress and kind of the same feeling. This one's very high drama. I need to figure out what to do in the foreground because that's so boring right now. But anyways, you can kind of see as the colors bend and shift up. So whether it has clouds or it's a clean, pure sky, whether it's a pinker sky, a yellower sky, or a bluer sky, a lot of the same idea exists. I hope that makes sense. What I'm gonna be referring to very quickly is probably my most suggested uh, landscape painting book, and I talked about it quite a bit, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. I very much, it's really difficult because the whole section on color, you can see all the highlighted parts. Um, yeah, this book I read a lot. Um, all my little notes sticking out of it. Um, this is my favorite book, but unfortunately it's only in black and white, which is really sad. Um, and it makes it hard to uh, completely understand. Um, mo uh, many of his paintings actually burned up in a fire. And uh, so we don't have really that many great copies um, of our photos of his paintings. They burned up before color photography, I guess. Um, but you can find definitely some online. That's John F. Carlson, C-A-R-L-S-O-N. Um, on page 66, 
he has this little diagram, again, the colors of the sky. And I'm gonna redo this for the class in color. So don't worry about you know buying the book just for this. Um, and it's just this little tiny thing, but I think it's so important. Um, I actually always have this page marked to refer to. And what it basically is saying there <laughs> is, um, I can't even read it. But anyways, he says right along the horizon, there's a, a red band generally. So if my horizon line were here, and I'm gonna put all my horizon lines in all these very low, because this is not a landscape painting, it's a skyscape paintings. Um, and I might make a little bit of something interesting and there's some clouds or an ocean or whatever else, um, but it's basically about the sky. But anyways, he says right above the horizon line, is, and I'm going to exaggerate these colors in the first one, is a violet red. And that's just kind of a band of color. So that's a very, I've added quite a bit of white. I can make it a little bit darker so it's a little easier to see. And that's kind of right along the horizon. And what's going on there oftentimes is uh, dust from the earth, pollution from the humans on the earth. Um, and you're looking through a lot more lens of atmosphere. When you start looking up above us, the air is just getting purer and purer and purer. And you're looking through uh, less layers of atmosphere. All right, he then says right above that, it goes a little bit towards an oranger color. So it begins to warm up comparatively. You guys are going to have fun after you see this of going and observing it in nature if we ever get clear skies again. Um, also, as you go and look at other people's landscape paintings or you look through my paintings, you'll begin to notice how ubiquitous this information is in successful landscape paintings. Um, so that's kind of an orangey red a little bit. Again, it's mixed with white because I want to kind of make it a little bit realistic. And now it's going to go towards just a touch more orange. He calls this the orange zone. I'm trying to keep my values fairly similar as I'm moving up. Orange, yellow, And this zone is slightly bigger generally than either of the ones beneath it. It's probably a little bigger than both of those combined oftentimes. Suppose I should probably zoom that camera in a little bit. Move that down. It'll be easier to see as I get the colors filled in. We then go to a fairly large quadrant of the sky which he calls yellow green or yellowish green. If I were using the cobalt teal, this would be a great spot for it. I'm gonna add a touch of my manganese blue. I'm gonna whiten that.
every time you look at the sky, these versions of these colors are going to be different. So there's no like formula I can teach you that would be useful all the time. Like there's no way to just say, this is how you paint sky because it's always going to change upon every reference and every time you see the sky, I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. And I'm going to begin to bend it towards blue. Yeah. Michael, is that band maybe yellowish green as big as the violet orange and orange yellow bands combined in theory it would even be bigger oftentimes but it okay. will really depend on the sky that you're looking at yeah michael it seems to be showing up mostly white I don't know yeah, if it's once I get this covered and there's not the strong contrast next to it. Uh, okay. I'll be able to see it better. And I will take photos of all of this and post it. So you'll be able to refer to it on the Facebook page. We now get up to a yellow, a greenish blue zone. And the cool thing with all this tape is I'll actually be able to put some notes beside it after I remove the tape. Um, a greenish blue zone. So so instead of a yellowish green zone, it's a blue, greenish blue zone. We're all gonna mix slight variations on this that are different, but. And I'll see if I can't find or take a good photo of this picture in the book, even though it's black and white, it'll give you that to refer to. And then we get up to our violet blue zone. And that's where I might start using my French ultramarine a little more. So this blue is a little bit more leaning towards purple. Could everyone just check the mute on their screen? So I've got this band of color here is a little dark because the, um, the gray is showing through. You may want to do these exercises on a nice clean white surface. Um, that way the transparency of the paint isn't affecting the color as much. So I'm going to bring in a little more of yellow green zone and make it a little thicker. I'm going to bring in my ground here just so we don't have And what color? Let's just make it a nice, simple field. So 
mix up some kind of earthy green here. Michael, did you use your split primary palette for that? I did, yeah. That's the split primary palette, yep. Add a little bit of red to the foreground here, just to kind of bring that ground plane a little bit towards us. And just for fun, I'll break up. So this uh, magenta version, or this um, violet at the bottom is really strong. So it instantly begins to feel kind of like sunset a little bit. So I would probably subdue this if it were a blue, you know, midday, those um, would actually be less that. I'm just kind of breaking up. So it's we've got a little interest going on, whatever's going on down here. And landscape. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that is the bands of color. I'm going to do, um, or I could do another one um, with making it, this feels a little too sunsetty. So if I were to do another, I, maybe I will focus more on the blues. Uh, could, you zoom, could you zoom in real quick because it looks very white and pastel from, from the white. This overhead light. There we go. You able to see that pretty well? Much better. Okay, yeah. Thanks for saying that. And I'll do that. I'll keep it there on the next one. Um, so you can see that these bands of color are definitely on the warmer side. Um, I'm going to try to do very quickly a, a, maybe I'll even do it to the side here, a very much blue sky. But it's still going to be influenced a touch by these colors. So I'm going to do a bluer, kind of an almost overtly blue. I posted one of those on the Facebook page as well. I'm going to bring it up to you so I have it as a reference. Um, yeah, the very last one I put is very rich. It's much more on the French ultramarine or French marine sides. Very, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, it's very heavy on the violet blue zone. So this zone up here on this one down here will be much larger. Okay. So let's put our let's get our horizon line in. All right, I'm going to bring in just a touch of that so I can see where you're at here. So I'm going to mix my colors just down here a little bit. So this is the color that I used pre in the previous painting as my um, violet red. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add quite a bit of white to that. And I'm going to make it much smaller band. Then we get to our orangey red. So I'll pull down a little bit of that, put it beside there. And I'm going to add more white to that too, which will cool it down. When we add white to a color, we're cooling it down. And maybe just a touch of yellow to it. Much smaller bands of color than the one above it. I'm going to soften that transition. All right. And that stripe there is a little bothersome.
So yeah, as I do this, I am going to suggest that you probably paint your skies on white to start with, um, just because that gray is coming through and uh, altering my color slightly. My orange yellow zone. Same thing, bringing it down so you can see it. I'm gonna add quite a bit of white. I'm gonna cool that down because again, this is just midday that I'm looking for, or you know, at least not sunset. And this will be a little more extreme than you probably might see in nature, but by seeing it like this, and these will show up again a little better here in just a second. Um, you, uh, we'll be able to see it in nature. So you can kind of, and oftentimes in painting, we exaggerate. So my yellow green, I've got kind of a turquoise. I'm gonna add just a touch of yellow to that, maybe even a little more white. Did not clean my brush very well, so I'm pulling in a little of the magentas, sneaking its way in. Sneaky little magenta. Oops, too much. All right, so I need to clean my brush, and I can see the magenta right on the brush. So that was, that was bad of me. That was just straight lazy. So give me one half second while I clean the brush and get that magenta off there. All right, I'm going to remix that color because it's a little of my quinacridone, touch of my cool light yellow, and a lot of white. And again, these are condensed the other way. So whereas the other colors were big going up towards the dark of the blue up above, these are condensed the other way. Now I'm getting towards my greenish blue. Just adding more blue to the previous mixture. Add a little bit of white to that. Add just a touch of paint thinner, just a drop make my paint a little more, a little faster. I'm gonna darken that, it's a little too light. And so I'm consolidating all these zones so that I can make my big violet blue zone, much bigger. And have this violet blue, we mix a touch of the quinacridone, you guys seeing that? Yeah, big jump in color, right? So I'm gonna start at the top. It's almost the painter's blue, painter's tape blue. Start blending it with that blue as we get closer to it. So when you're out looking at your scene or when you're looking at your references, really observe what's happening at the top of the sky, what's happening at the bottom, where, what's happening to the colors as they meet? Are they becoming
Are they subtle? Are they strong? Are the transitions crisp? Are they very soft transitions? All right, I'm gonna add some blue-gray mountains back there. Michael, is your horizon line about three quarters down on the page? Yeah, even more like three, yeah, three quarters, yeah. That'd be about right. And I'm just kind of putting random foreground color. Please mute your video. Yes, that would be great because then we can't see him. Uh, okay. All right, mountains. And uh, you can see even by pushing this band is so much less extreme than that band but it still has kind of a sunset feel. So in truth, I would probably even wanna make that even more subtle. It can go all the way to almost blue with just slightly a bend towards pink. And I want you to look for that again when we get some clearer skies um, and just uh, observe that um, and experiment with that. But, you know, so I could, maybe what I'll do, let's see if I can get a, if I have a clean brush left in the house. <laughs> I don't think I've ever used so many paintbrushes in one day. Um, I'm going to bring some of this blue that I have here and let's bring it down and infuse it with that beautiful pink horizon so that the horizon line isn't so sunsetty. We want What about making that um, first band more of a blue violet, a little less red violet? Yeah, exactly. And that's what you would do as you observe. I'm playing these up for effect, you know, just to kind of show them to you. But you will even see in the references that I have that they're much more on the blue. Yeah, exactly. Great, great observation. Great idea. Um, and I'm just playing them up you know, kind of putting them as the colors as he describes them versus what we would see. Um, let's add a little. Fog back there, soften our horizon. A lot of times when I paint in atmosphere and fog and stuff, I will just pull it right out of the sky because that way they kind of, they have that innate relationship. All right, I'm gonna zoom back out. We can see a little bit of a comparison. Next week, what I'll be talking about is actually the three value planes in the land and the fourth in the sky. So that we'll get that as our next fundamental. 
So don't worry too much about your landscape plane. Um, in fact, you don't even need it if you don't want to have land in your painting at all. It could be straight sky. Um, I'm going to do, oh, I still got time. So I got three more I can do. Um, I want to do uh, some one leaning more towards the reds, one leaning more towards um, the greens, and one very light one. Value. I love painting in the fall and I love going out and photographing in the fall because of the tractors kicking up the dirt makes some of the most beautiful sunsets that extra atmosphere is just something to really be appreciated all right so you'll see I'll, I'll do this one very light with a much more extreme horizon line this well actually that's kind of this one um let's do a warmer one more towards yellow mm -hmm. all right you guys are seeing everything here And if I were looking at my references, it's not like I would always use the same amount. They don't have the same amount of bands. Um, you know, you consolidate, but by knowing this and kind of knowing what, at least what I should be seeing versus maybe even what I really am seeing, it can be really helpful. Michael, I had a question. Um, what on your gray, what value is that? Like if from one to 10, how dark do you want that value or does it matter? Uh, I mean, I, I personally tried to aim for a five, but it's much darker than that. Um, and again, feel free to paint right on to white. I think you will have an easier time seeing the colors if you do that. Um, What's kind of fun about having the gray is when I remove this tape, I'll have this nice border. Um, I kind of like that. Uh, but I, I don't want to add any unnecessary extra work. And I feel that this, um, this gray is because, again, some of these colors are quite transparent. Um, all right, let's do, what do you think, a little ocean, maybe? I don't know, a horizon line anyways. Mm. Do you guys want me to zoom in on that or do you want to see the whole scene? All right. I prefer a zoom. Yeah, I think it makes seeing the colors quite a lot easier, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, there, now we can see color. So I'm not really using a reference for this one. I'm just going to think kind of the same thing. I've got, I got my, my violet. I'm going to go towards a red, but I'm going to warm this red up. I'm also going to make it a little less perfect. Like you said, you warmed the red. What color did you add? I used, so the first color was my quinacridone across the bottom with a lot of white. And then I just added the warmer red, the cadmium red to that. And we'll see if that works. I mean, magenta? Uh, you know what? I'm not positive because I don't usually have so many colors on my palette. Um, it sure may have been because it's quite cool. I mean, Unfortunately, I'm not really positive. Just grab back into it to. All right, now we get up to our orange 
It's going to get a little warmer even again, or at least a little more orangey. Adding quite a bit of white to it, though. So this is going to be much more blatant on the sunset side. So now it says go to the yellowish green zone, but because I'm painting a whole scene that's on kind of the yellow pink uh, on the warmer face, I'm not going to go so much towards green. It might go there just a touch, but it's much more on the yellow side of that, I'm hoping. Yeah. So again, it's just comparative to the color underneath, the color that it's beside. So when I say, you know, greener, it's definitely greener, isn't it? Orange to more of a yellow is greener, but, you know, I could say yellower. And then it wants me to go slightly more towards the blue, but again, it's a variation on that because Now, where I would be getting up towards a violet blue, typically, this one never gets there because it's all warmer, right? So this is where you get to start experimenting with your colors. It's So mine's getting greener. Which would be considered bluer. So you see how we still have a lot of the same kind of bands of color that gray is showing through a lot, isn't it? Maybe I'll push that green just a little bit, play it up. Are you guys seeing a blinking symbol right in the middle of the screen? Yes. Sorry about that. I don't know what that is about. Give me one second. I'm going to quickly go through my options here. What does that mean, I wonder? Do you have it on a steady, uh, steady shot? What is steady shot? What do you mean? Where it doesn't shake, um, where it automatically holds it more steady. It looks like it's got a shaking hand. Yeah. You stopped filming? Oh, did it go away? No, it's still there, but could it mean that you're not filming? Sure, hope that's not the case. It, it says recording up in the corner. Okay, great. Let's try Superior Auto. Woo! That's where we wanted it. There's some color. All right, <laughs> we'll figure this out. Sorry, you guys. Anyways, there's kind of another band of color. Let's uh, let's play. Bring in some ocean, maybe.
Michael, is your ocean in the back sort of a muted, almost Payne's gray next to the pink? Yeah. I just grabbed some blue and mixed it kind of with some of the horizon line color. Let's see if I can add some colorful waves on there real quick. Just use a little palette knife trick. All I did was just dip my palette knife into a couple of the colors that were in the sky there and grab them. Insta Ocean. <laughs> oh, silly. I can see you're having a lot of fun over here. Always. Yeah, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing when I just make myself laugh when I'm painting, but you know, it's there's so much delight when you don't care. I mean, I care, of course, because you guys are watching and learning. But it's, you know, it reminds me of being a little kid and watching Bob Ross, right? I mean, it's kind of like happy accidents. Let's just kind of see what happens and uh, have fun and push some I love it. around and test some stuff. And uh, I guess the main thing I want you to show you is that it's not precious. It's just, you know, let's have some fun. Let's try and experiment and... Uh, All right. I don't know what this super bright red color is there. I don't know if that's just from the light or what's going on. But anyways, there we go. We've got kind of a yellow or greener sky. All right. Somebody tell me a color. Purple? Time. What's that? Nighttime. Nighttime. All right. So we're going to do it as if the sun has set quite some time ago. Okay, the sun has set. I'm going to clean my brush a little bit here. So we still have a tiny band of color. All right, let's throw in our magenta horizon line. Much darker. All right, now I'm gonna take that. Again, I'm still kind of paying attention up to the colors saying towards my orange red zone. So I'm going to warm that up just a touch, but it's still quite dark, maybe a little more white than I have. We'll see. And so remember, we're not, it's not orange red, it's orange ish. It's whatever color I want it to be, but bends a little bit towards the orange red zone. Um, orange yellow, I'm gonna slightly bend it over that way, but not much. And what this does is it creates a transition, this kind of yellow band above these reddish bands, in theory is kind of creating a transition to get towards those blues.
All right. Now we're going to go towards our yellowish green, but it's much darker. Never been a big fan of painting night scenes black skies. Um, feel like if you just paint a black sky, you make Van Gogh cry, and that guy already shed enough tears. I remember Starry Starry Night and all the colors he hid in there. I did add a little bit of the Payne's gray into this, but I could make my dark any other any way. So it's the French ultramarine plus Payne's gray plus a touch of my manganese blue. Very dark. So now I'm gonna grab a slightly different brush. And I'm going to bring those colors from up to down. I'm basically consolidating and bringing the bands of color closer together. A lot of times our night skies can actually have a lot of reflected light into them. If you have like a cityscape or you're in town, there's light bouncing up into the sky. You guys have all probably seen that. When you look out at night, all of a sudden the sky looks kind of orangish or other things. So that's something to be aware of. Mm. I'm just adding, my paint was a little too thin on there. So I was cheating. I was using that gray. I'm using a crappy shop brush here to blend and it's dropping hairs like crazy. So I'll spend the, uh, my after class cleaning my 100 paint brushes I've used and uh, picking hairs out of this thing. But uh, small price to pay for all the fun we're having. Do you ever add stars? Yeah, definitely. I like to use the back of my paintbrush. Oh, Ooh, very dark. Yeah. Would you please mute your mic? I can't see the painting anymore. Sorry to keep asking. Yeah, if you just always have it muted and then press the space bar to talk, that generally seems to be the best as far as, that way you don't have to try to remember. So it's 
some trees there, I guess. I don't know. It looks like maybe there's a phone that is open. I see Kim Catalina on two things and I'm not to point out a name or anything, but um, it looks like that's the only one that's not muted. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Easy to not realize for sure. Yeah, my good big example is I was in a meeting with a whole bunch of teachers and we were actually talking about how to use Zoom. One of the guys got up, walked off, you know, away. Like, I guess he had learned everything he needed to learn. And of course, then his dog just started barking. Kind of an incessant long bark. So every time it barked, it took over the scene and And generally with my stars, I won't add them pure white or maybe just a couple, but this is a light blue. Maybe some pink. They start to get a little redundant, da, 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 all the same size. So maybe I would grab a, a different shape just to get them. I can actually make them brighter further away from the horizon line. Less, less light pollution down there or up there. I don't know, maybe the stars are a little bit silly, but kind of fun. Um, one thing you can kind of do too is I'll give us maybe some a little band of light back there. Maybe there's a whole city down there or something. I don't know. Um, all right. Yeah, I don't love the stars, but uh, what I could do too is very lightly just kind of tap them. Look at this brush. Where is that? There. Just mauled up. I took that and chopped it up into crazy ways. Fun for just making shapes that I don't want to be uh, regular, irregular shapes grasses and whatnot. Um, all right, one more color for our final one. We got a long band of color here. And then actually have this one, I wanna bring in some clouds. So I'm going to do green sky. You guys looking forward to painting these? Just having fun with color and experimenting, trying yeah, definitely. Just free yourself up, have fun. If they really don't work or you're really unhappy, just don't share them on the Facebook page. It never happened. Just add a little bit of paint thinner to speed up the paint here a little bit. Make it a little slipperier. There's really quite a lot of drag there. And I'm going to go ahead and experiment with that crazy manganese hue. Make a bright green, bam. Just 
turquoise sky. This brush is not great for this. So I put it down, it's not the color I want. Don't keep painting with it, even if it's the wrong color. Just pick it up, go start mixing again. There we go. It seems like whenever I paint green skies, because I'm not afraid to, I actually like green skies. They make pink clouds look really nice. Um, people always comment that the only time they ever see green skies is tornadoes. I've never seen a tornado, so I guess I'm not um, scared of them. I don't know. I don't think about them, but uh, it can be a kind of a trigger for some people. Um, so just kind of be aware. When I lived in Tennessee, I saw my first green sky and we had a horrific tornado. All right. So yeah, you maybe don't want to paint um, a green sky. <laughs> If it brings back scary memories. Um, it's kind of a turquoise sky, turquoisey green. Um, I'm gonna paint a purple band underneath it just because I wanna see what it looks like. I'm just scrubbing all over the palette and picking up little bits of color to see what color I end up with. Putting in some little bow elements here. All right, so we have our base skies. I'm going to zoom back out. Class is pretty much over. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to throw a pink cloud in there, speaking of. Oops, I'm totally blocking your view. I apologize, you guys. There are some pink clouds. Is there a reason that you're kind of going 
up as opposed to painting them down? Is it perspective? Um, like going this way? I mean, yeah. I guess down if I came this way, but uh, I knew that my color would be pure at the beginning of my paint stroke. And so as it's picking up, I kind of want it to just kind of wisp off. But no, you could definitely do it both ways, I would think. Um, night sky. Maybe we have a nice little bit of a night cloud thing going on here. Maybe I'll obliterate some of these stars. Yes, I don't know if you guys noticed how crazy this paintbrush is. It's just this really long um, bristles and it's just fun to see what happens with it. It's um, some kind of an Egbert craziness. There we go. Now, what do we got? We got orange. What do you think? Purple clouds? Blue clouds, white clouds, yellow clouds, yellow clouds. Let's put yellow on yellow. See what happens. See, right? I've had my fun. I've experimented. I don't care what happens to these paintings because I'm not selling them or showing them. So now I can experiment on them guilt free. Michael, if you were making a paler sky. I'm sorry, what? A paler, paler, like lighter colored sky. Uh huh. What, what colors would you blend with the, you know, a darker, what colors would you blend to make it lighter? White? Sure. White will make it lighter, it'll make it cooler. Um, Somebody was asking about Naples yellow is a great co color for lightning without cooling down completely. It's a kind of a yellow down. I'm gonna add a little bit of pink into this cloud. Oh, too much. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I would kind of experiment and see. What yellow did you use there? Was it which yellow and a little white? Uh, blah. Probably just my Indian yellow primarily. There may be a touch of the warm, uh, Indian yellow, sorry, lemon yellow. There may be a touch of the other one in there, um, but I'm not positive. Again, my palette is hard to know <laughs> what colors I'm still using. So I'm just drawing, grabbing from my mixes now. Um, so I don't necessarily always know what I'm grabbing. And that's why uh, I, I get asked a lot to teach uh, painting color formulas. Um, I remember a student very, getting upset at me because I wouldn't tell them how to paint the blue or the ocean color of Oregon Sea. And I knew what they meant. You know, it's not turquoise. It's not a bright, warm ocean. It's dark and foreboding. But there's no color of the sea because it depends on are you close to the sand? Are you far from the sand? Are you in term, you know, tumulus water, is it evening? Is it morning? Is it, where's the light hitting it from? So uh, I, I try not to teach formulas. I just would rather teach you 
how to ask questions of your artwork, of yourself, and how to um, come up with possible answers. All right, that leaves our two blue guys. I'm gonna leave this one because I need one base painting just to refer to. So that gets me up to this crazy guy. And I think that he deserves a nice, colorful cloud, possibly. Let's see. It's always like, man, what can I get away with? Can I add a crazy, ultra bright cloud? Can the painting get away with that? I don't know. Maybe that's too too light. That's... Now it's too dark. Back and forth we go. And what if I just drag my brush across it possibly? Clean my brush mostly, it's still got. I do find that a lot of times when I'm painting clouds, sorry, I'm stepping on the camera tripod. Um, I do make my uh, clouds closer to the horizon line, a little uh, more horizontal. And then as they go up, I will add a little bit more angle. I am excited, you guys, to see what you come up with. Have fun. You know, make some of them on the more realistic side, make some of them on the more crazy side. The only minimum that I'm asking is one reference sky, somewhat like this, so that you have it, and the color wheel with the split, split primaries. All of the other stuff, is bonus. You get to sit in the front of the class next week, you get a gold star, and you get invited to the pizza party at the end of the year. Um, but otherwise, do as much or as little as you feel like. This, this is for you. I don't want to add pressure. In fact, I'm hoping that what I just showed you takes pressure off to just see, oh, he's just having fun. He's just, it, oh, sorry, not even showing you what I'm painting. He's just experimenting. Um, I mean, that's more fun than it was without the pink clouds. I had no idea if they were going to work. But now I know that these colors have some potential and I could bring that in possibly in a bigger painting, a painting I do care about. Um, Do you generally do this kind of experimenting on your own or do you find um, it just um, beneficial to do it in a class and create and have fun that way? Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try not to unplug the camera and try not to make you guys seasick, but I'm gonna quickly scan around my studio and just show you guys what's going on in there. Oops, I need to zoom back out, sorry. Experiments, 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 experiments. You guys see back? We lost, uh, I'm plugged. All right, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Can you hear me still? Yes. yes. All right, I'm gonna come over and look you in the eyes and tell you what I'm gonna do. How do I get over Alt 
N. Oh, it went back. Alt N. <laughs> Why is it not? Huh, maybe I have to turn that back on. The still image. Well, what I'm going to do, you guys, is I'm going to video a little on my phone. And uh, I will show you my piles and stacks and stacks and stacks of playing and experiments. Um, and uh, if you were in my last class, I told you guys about the fact that at the beginning uh, or after Christmas, kind of that dead time in between Christmas and New Year's, especially when you're COVIDing, is um, I painted over like 40 paintings. Um, sanded them down, painted over them, put another 40 in boxes that are going to need more heavy duty sanding. And I threw, well, gave away um, to other people just to paint over, not probably another 40 paintings. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always experimenting, always playing. It's um, this, what I was just doing there is my happy place. It's super fun for me. And you know, all day long, I will be painting on commissions and projects for galleries and everything else. And it's taxing. Um, you guys know that it seems like painting should be the most relaxing, fun thing in the world, but it is exhausting. You know, I hate it when, you know, my friends and wife and everybody makes fun of me. All she did was paint all day. Yeah, but you're thinking every brushstroke is a thought. It's like trying to speak a foreign language with somebody. It's so tiring. Um, it, but it is, it's so rewarding and it's so fun um, that this is my reward at the end of the day. I will often use up my less leftover paint in this way. Some of those paintings that I showed you um, are ones that aren't going to galleries necessarily. You know, I might sell them through my own website or whatever else. Um, but those are my fun time at the end. And I just, you know, if worse comes to worse, I just wipe them off and do something over it. Um, so yeah, I'm always playing, I'm always experimenting, I'm always what ifing, and I'm constantly looking at other people's work. And from there going, oh, I wanna do that. Oh, how'd they do that? Um, I mean, that's the new color scheme, right? Is the what if. What if I tried to paint like my computer prints? Um, so now I need to experiment with that and play with that, but I've also got a real job. You know, my boss is kind of an ass. He'd get angry if I just, keep playing all the time. So I got to do my job and then I can have my time off and uh, um, play and experiment. So I love all of it. I'm sorry for the bad word. <laughs> um, you guys are awesome. Please, uh, any questions, I will do photos of these so that we can give them better color. I'll post those on the Facebook, the color, ski, the color wheels and the little landscapes I just did. I will do a quick video if you care, a little studio tour, and I won't even clean up because it is straight chaos. I'm, I'm tripping over stuff right now between my daughters and my projects we've been working on. Um, and that's it. I will be looking for all of you guys on the Facebook page. Um, does that, yeah, everybody has my email. Feel free to shoot me an email too. Um, any questions and um, yeah, anything else you guys? Anybody have any wise parting words? <laughs> I don't have any right now. All right. Awesome, you guys. This was fun. I hope you had a great time. And I really look forward to seeing you next week and look for the recording in a couple hours. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks, Amanda. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. That was fun, you guys. Thank you. Take care.